Okay, so um, I do see from the uh, from there's a lot of Special Olympics people on the call, so great to see that. But um, I hope you'll forgive me, those of you who are very familiar with Special Olympics, because I'm going to start and just give a little bit of an overview of who we are and what we do for anybody who's not yet familiar. Um, so thank you, Sergio, for the lovely invitation to be here. Um, and hopefully there'll be something of interest here, but really looking forward to the discussion afterwards as well. Um, so just, I can get this to skip on. Lovely. So just for those who are not so familiar with Special Olympics, um, we're in existence since the 1960s. Um, we're founded by Eunice Kennedy Shriver, who's the sister of John Fitzgerald Kennedy, um, president of the US. And it was set up originally as a day sports camp for people with intellectual disability, primarily for children with intellectual disability. And Eunice Kennedy Shriver realized really early on the power that sport had to include people in, in the community and, and the power it had to help people grow. And this is one of the reasons that she set up this camp. And very quickly it grew to become um, what we now know to be the Special Olympics. Uh, first World Games were held in 1968, so over 50 years ago in Soldiers Field in Chicago, um, with two nations taking part, the United States, 26 of those states represented, and Canada. Um, and really since then, we've, we've grown a long, long way. Um, but our mission has stayed the same. And I know this is a big wordy um, mission and I don't expect everybody to be reading it, but the couple of things that I really wanted to highlight in it are the fact that Special Olympics is year round. It's not just about the Special Olympics World Games, which everybody is, is familiar with. It's about training and competing on a week in, week out basis within the local community. And the main mission that Special Olympics has is to provide people with intellectual disabilities with the opportunity to participate in sport, to develop fitness, develop skills, and become part of the community. And so just in terms of who we are now, so moving on from those 1,000 athletes in two countries back in 1968, we now stretch to 6.3 million athletes around the world, um, about 40% female, a little over 40% female, 60% um, male. And you'll see there from the age groups that were quite evenly spread across um, the eight to 15 category, 16 to 21 and 22 plus. So most of our participants are youth. Um, and we have a small number of athletes participating in the two to seven year old age group, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, we've also got, and, and Ken mentioned the unified sport, so we will talk about that a little bit more later, Ken, so thanks for the lovely intro on that. Um, so we've got about 1.7 million individuals with and without intellectual disability who are unified teammates, so participating in our unified sport program all around the world and over half a million coaches. And those figures are actually from our 2018 uh, census, so we're expecting that they're going to have grown a little bit more when we get our 2019 figures in the next few weeks. So we're big um, and we are spread all around the world. So our biggest regions would be in our Asia Pacific region where we have over 2 million athletes participating and um, smaller participation numbers in some of the other regions. But, but you can see that we have a global presence and the biggest sports that we have are the standard big ones, athletics, football, basketball, swimming, the sports that we typically see really high participation numbers in across the, across the spectrum. So in terms of uh, inclusion, I, I suppose based on the, the, the seminar today, we wanted to talk about where we're at in terms of inclusion now and where we were in the past and what inclusion means to us now and in the past. So the first thing to say is very clearly, we're at very different stages of then and now in different parts of the world. So um, in, in Europe, in North America, the status of Special Olympics and the level of inclusion that we see is very different to what we see in other parts of the world. So in the past, and some countries and some parts of the world are still in that then phase, um, we were an organization for people with intellectual disabilities. We provided really the only opportunity that those individuals had to participate in any form of sport, and really one of the few opportunities that they had to showcase their abilities. Um, and for very many reasons, which were very good and very fair, we were a pretty exclusive organization. So it was a pretty exclusive way to include people with disabilities. So what did it look like for us in terms of the inclusion spectrum? Well, we very definitely were sitting in that disability sport area. 
Um, we hadn't quite reached the reverse inclusion that, that Ken is talking about earlier, but we, we'll, we'll talk about that in a little minute. But very much we were a sport specifically for people with intellectual disabilities. And those were the only people who participated in our sport programming. And we sort of fell into all three of these areas, I suppose, in terms of, of the, the inclusion spectrum and how we operated our sport. We did see modified activities happening um, within, uh, within sports clubs, within schools, very much uh, the se separate and alternate activities happening, and certainly a lot of parallel activities where we would have had athletes very much grouped by ability level. Um, probably a lot of the time what we also saw was individuals being grouped just simply in the fact that they were athletes with disabilities and categorized as very simply low ability or high ability. And things really weren't a whole lot more nuanced than that. But over the years, things have started to change. Um, and now we are moving towards being an organization that is run by and with people with intellectual disabilities rather than just for them. Um, it's one of many, many opportunities that are out there now for people with intellectual disabilities to play sport. And we think that that's a really good thing. Um, people now, people with intellectual disabilities now have the opportunity to play sport in far more inclusive environments. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Um, but we see that our role in Special Olympics is to provide the opportunity for athletes with intellectual disabilities to build the confidence and the skills to be empowered to play sport whenever they want, wherever they want and with whomever they want. So it doesn't necessarily need for us to, to sit just exclusively within that um, small bubble that, that we previously existed in. So to look at uh, 21st century Special Olympics and how we are using the inclusion spectrum, I suppose we, we would see it that we are now embracing the inclusion spectrum in all its glory. Um, so with, with really with the step um, tool at the center of it. Uh, so in terms of disability sport, I mean, this is the core of what we do. This will always be the core of what we do as an organization. We will always offer traditional Special Olympic sport programming for people with intellectual disabilities. And it's got a really important, really valid place in the world. Um, but what we've started to do since the 1980s is introduce unified sports, which Ken mentioned as a, as a really lovely example of reverse integration. And unified sports is when players with and without intellectual disabilities, ideally of the same age group um, and approximately same ability level, play together on the same team. So they train together, they compete together, they travel to competition together, and they are a group of peers um, who, who play sport together. And we see that as a really quick way to develop friendships and achieve social inclusion. And we're seeing more and more the impact of that as we have generations, of, particularly of students who've grown up through playing unified sports. And they, they live in, I believe, in a much more inclusive world than existed 20 years ago. Um, unified sports obviously operates well in a team environment, but we also have unified sports programming available in what would be traditionally individual sports um, or pair sports like badminton, table tennis, uh, tennis. But we see as well uh, unified teams competing in athletics and swimming where they compete as part of a school team, um, which I think is a really, really nice way um, of, of making sure that everybody in every sport has the opportunity to, to play and compete inclusively. Um, and as I mentioned, it happens both in community and in sport uh, or and in school programming. So it's quite pervasive around the world. Um, and that 1.7 million unified teammates around the world is growing year on year. So certainly excited to see where that goes in the next, uh, in, our, in our next census data, which we'll get in the next few weeks. Um, but what's probably a little bit newer for us, um, and I'm, I suppose I'm looking a little bit on the competition side of things and how we, how the inclusion spectrum, and maybe this is not using the right way, Ken, <laughs> How, how our competition um, structure reflects that, those, um, that structure of the inclusion spectrum. And what we're seeing now quite a lot more within Special Olympics is we're no longer having isolated uh, competition opportunities where we, you know, we live in our own little bubble aside from the rest of the sports community. We're running uh, events and opportunities for competition for athletes 
through mainstream competitions. So a really nice example of this was, was at the ITU World Triathlon Series, where there was a Special Olympics division. And it ran um, alongside our World Games uh, last March, but, but as part of the ITU event. And that's a really wonderful opportunity for athletes. Not only are they having the chance to, to compete on, at a high level, but they are in there in the mix with the international triathletes, the age group athletes, and part of that ITU community and that world. And that's, that's hugely valuable for us. And we're starting as well to see a lot more of our athletes participating in open competition. And I think this is absolutely fantastic. This for me is the goal where we have our athletes who have the confidence, have the skill set, and have the um, have the welcome there for them to participate in regular events that are happening in their local community. So I've given you some examples there, which have gone off the screen. Apologies for that. But for example, the the Boston Marathon, we have athletes running in that every year. Uh, national floorball leagues, soccer leagues in the in local communities, road races, open water swims. And our athletes are participating in these events and they're not participating in a special Olympics division. Although in some cases, as I, as explained earlier, that does happen, but they're competing just in, alongside everybody else. And they're there because they're welcome and they're there because they deserve to be there. And they're there because they're part of the sports community. Um, and so our role in that, okay, we're, we're not running those events, but our role, we see it as a facilitator, a supporter, a partner, um, somebody who collaborates and supports and prepares those individuals so that they can fledge the nest and they can go and they compete in those events. And Special Olympics is always gonna be there for them where they need it, where they want it. But those opportunities are now becoming much more available. And I think it's a real sign of a much more inclusive world that is developing. And it's still a work in progress for sure. And then we have our separate modified activities that are happening all the time this is this is what i would think are, are really the bread and butter of our special olympics programming is how our coaches coach and um, whether or not they're familiar with the inclusion spectrum and many of them are but whether or not they are this is the bread and butter of what they do how they modify their sessions how they categorize how they move people in and out of sessions to make sure every athlete receives the coaching and the direction and the guidance that they need to be the best athlete they can possibly be. And we see this happening, as I said, through, through community Special Olympics clubs. We see it happening through Federation sports clubs in local communities. We see it happening through schools programming and our, our unified champion schools, which um, introduces uh, inclusion, not just on the sports field, but off the sports field as well, through education. And all of these are underpinned by STEP. STEP is one of the tools we hear coaches using the most often um, in, in their training, in their, in their development. We hear them talking about how they use STEP to modify their activities. But we don't do all of this on our own. Um, we are now part of the global sports family. And this little graphic here, I'm not going to go into too much detail in it, but, but just this is really just to show that we currently have um, nearly, nearly 750 sports partnerships with international sports federations, with organizations like iCoachKids. And they are so crucial to supporting us to deliver our mission to provide people with disabilities with the best access to sport programming. And specifically around this iCoachKids program and our, the age group that we're looking at, we have two key programs that look at this, this age group. So our Young Athletes program, um, it provides uh, an, an inclusive fundamental movement and sports skills program for children aged two to seven. And it's, it's been running for a little over 10 years now and it's hugely, hugely popular. But as a result of this program, we realized that there were so many athletes who were not moving into traditional sports. And so my colleagues in the young athletes team are at the moment creating a developmental sports program, which will help support coaches to support those athletes to make the transition into structured sport. And this is where I coach kids is so vital to us. Um, so they're focusing on the uh, kids aged six to 12 and they're working with um, creating some age appropriate sports programming for children with intellectual disabilities, but also which can be delivered in a very inclusive environment. So through schools and communities and um, the program will be delivered through multi-sport multi um, experiences, which 
we believe is really important in the development of, of our athletes, but also can be delivered in a, a sports specific club um, situation or school situation. And it really focuses on skill development and introduction to, to formal sport, I guess, in an age and developmentally appropriate way. So just to give you a quick overview, some of the sports that we're currently looking at, and these, I'm conscious I'm running out of time, sorry. Um, and these are the sports um, that we're currently looking at, but we are always looking for new sports partners to work with. So for any, uh, any representatives from sports federations that are interested in engaging with us on this, we're, we're really excited to start pushing this out a little bit more. And our work with iCoach Kids has been really crucial. We're, we're creating some e-learning content and some uh, implementation guides that will be available in the very near future. So in short, we've got a lot done, but we have a lot more to do. We believe the world can be a much more inclusive place and we're constantly working towards that, but we believe that we can also be a much more inclusive organization. And we are continuing to, to push forward in that direction. We're embracing a, this concept of unified leadership where we work with individuals with intellectual disabilities, not for them, not to uh, deliver a program for them, but to deliver programs with them in line with what their needs and wants are. And I suppose fundamentally, we believe that inclusion is not just a single action that a person takes or that a coach takes or that a club takes. It's about a way of life and a way of thinking. Um, and so that is really where we're at. There's a couple well, I'm very difficult to read links here um, that I, I'm sure you can you can uh, refer to if, if that's helpful. Um, you'll find lots of resources on our website on specialolympics.org. And in addition, we've got an online learning portal, which has lots of um, interesting resources there for coaches, uh, e-learning modules at learn.specialolympics.org. So please do feel free. All of that is free and available to anyone who, who wishes to, um, to visit. And Sergio, I'll wrap up and hand back to you now. <laughs>